الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله All praises are due to Allah the creator, the cherisher and the sustainer of this universe and may his peace and blessings be upon his noble prophet Muhammad and his companions and descendants dear respected brothers and sisters Jazakum Allah khairan for coming to this workshop uh, I am very honored and very happy to see you again Alhamdulillah finally I'm back with you and uh, I'm back with a new workshop actually. It's a workshop on Tadabbur of Surat An-Nur. Uh, those among you who attended with us the uh, Tarbiya Imaniya course, which was eight weeks, it focused a lot on Tadabbur. And Tadabbur of the Quran is, is extremely important. It is heaven on earth. The one who wants to enter heaven on earth should learn how to do tadabbur of the Quran. It's, it's a world, it's another world. Actually, it's a journey. It's a journey of the mind. The mind is the traveler in this journey. And the flying or the walking of this journey is walking or moving between verses of the Quran. And the destination of the journey of Tadabbur is reaching the truth. So the mind tries to reach the truth through this journey uh, in the Quran. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, one of the four Abduls or al abadil al Arba'a, the four Sahaba whom their name, their name started with Abdul, and were very knowledgeable. Uh, of the Quran, namely Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Umar, and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud had a saying, he always used to say, هذا القرآن فعليكم بهذا القرآن فإنه مأدبة الله فمن استطاع منكم أن يأخذ من مأدبة الله فليفعل فإنما العلم بالتعلم. He said, this Quran is the banquet of Allah. The one of you who can take the, from the banquet of Allah, let him take as much as he can. Because learning can happen by seeking knowledge, which means no one, he also said, no one was born knowledgeable. Knowledge is sought by seeking knowledge. So you have to seek knowledge. And the best knowledge is the knowledge of the Quran. Today we are going to discuss Surah An-Nur and try to reflect upon the meaning of Surah An-Nur. There's no special hadith mentioned about Surah An-Nur except one hadith and it is a weak hadith. Uh, weak because it's Mursal, the chain of narration is incomplete. Uh, and Mujahid, Mujahid is a student of Ibn Abbas. He said, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, which is impossible that he heard it from the Prophet وسلم, which means that he forgot to mention the name of the Sahabi, and this in itself makes the chain of narration weak. But not very weak, because the one dropped from the chain is the Sahabi, is the is the, uh, the, the companion. And the narrator is a tabi'i, one of the students of the Sahaba, and it is nearly impossible that they lie. So it's when I, like, when I tell you, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, it means that I jumped all the chain of narration. So it's not considered a hadith when I say it like that. It's considered a very weak one because I didn't mention any one and maybe I lie but it's nearly impossible that one of those people who are the students of the Sahaba lie so but still it's a weak hadith and the, the hadith mentioned about Surah An-Nur it is teach your men Surah Al-Ma'idah and teach your women Surah An-Nur and of course the meaning is weird how come? Only men will learn Surah Al-Ma'idah and only women will learn Surah Al-Nur? Of course, he doesn't say only. 
So the ulama said, had this hadith been uh, authentic, then definitely it means uh, generally. M all women should learn Surah An-Nur, and of course men as well, but it's important for women. And generally, all men should learn Surah Al-Ma'idah, but it's Im all people, all men, but it's also important for uh, women. Actually, I, I believe that, um, that since Surah An-Nur is mainly about women, then maybe it's more, more important for men to learn it. So I don't see that the, the meaning of the hadith itself is, is, uh, is normal. So I, def I, I definitely don't really uh, think that there is anything can be built on this hadith. Okay? So we have to learn the Quran from cover to cover. That's what I believe. Talking about God's banquet, he says that the Quran is the banquet of God. The banquet is something that when yeah, yeah, someone makes for people, he makes it for people whom he loves. So this is the banquet of Allah, this Quran. It, this in itself gives me the, uh, when I reflect upon the word, I feel like Allah loves us. That's why he prepared this Quran for us. There's a lot of benefit in it. Uh, it can fix your life. It can really change your life. And still it's a banquet because it's nutrition. Nutrition for the soul and the nutrition of the heart. Yeah, a friend can make a banquet for you where he can serve you chicken and fish and meat. And well, Allah served a banquet for you. When he served you, he didn't serve you food here. He served you the nutrition of the soul and of the mind and of the heart. And there are two types of knowledge in the Quran. Ilm al-Tawheed wa ilm al-Af'al al-Abid. The knowledge of Tawheed, Tawheed means the unique oneness of God. It's wrong to say that Tawheed means oneness of God. It is the unique oneness of God. This is one uh, cup of water. And there's many like it. So saying oneness of God is not the right translation for Tawheed. But the unique oneness of God. God is one and uniquely one. There is nothing like unto him. And ilm af'al al-abid, which is the knowledge of the actions and dealings of people. How can people deal with each other and their actions? Through the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet, which is the explanation of the Quran, one can acquire tarbiyah. Tarbiyah entails the meanings of nourishing, education, discipline. And this tarbiyah is peculiar because it has very important characteristics that doesn't ex exist in any other type of tarbiyah. Number one, it's divine. It's Allah himself who is doing the tarbiyah for you, who is disciplining you. So it's divine tarbiyah. Second, it's holistic. It's perfect. It deals with the human being horizontally and vertically and in depth. Horizontally because it deals with you from the day you were born till the day you die. Through all the phases of life. Childhood, adulthood, when you even uh, become, when you're old and when you're dead. And vertically I mean that in all aspects of life. So it deals with you as a son, how to deal with your parents. As a parent, how to deal with your kids. As a husband, how to deal with your wife. As a wife, how to deal with your uh, husband. As a teacher, how in the school, in the university, in, uh, at work, everywhere. So at every moment of your life, it tells you how to deal with others everywhere. It's, it's, it covers you all your life. And when I say in depth, because it doesn't deal with you only 
as a physical being, but it also deals with the non-physical part of you, your soul and your heart. So the Quran deals with you physically and non-physically too. No any other kind of tarbiyah can do that. The tarbiyah of Allah is balanced because it deals, as we said before, with the four main things that need tarbiyah. The faculty of reason, your mind, your heart, your soul, and your body. The Quran deals with all this. And it's positive. It deals with you positively. It pushes you to be better. And it's not just ideal, but ideal and practical at the same time. It doesn't tell you to turn the left cheek to the one who slapped you on the right cheek all the time. Because sometimes some people, or actually even if I'm someone who can forgive, but maybe I can't forgive every time. So it tells you that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is available for you to take your revenge. But it also tells you but Allah loves those who show patience and perseverance. So it doesn't force you to forgive, but it allows you to take your revenge through the legal system, of course, but at the same time encourages you to forgive. Because not in one hand you can't find two similar fingers. So how come you think that we are all similar? Some of us can forgive and some of us not. And even those who can forgive, maybe not every time they can forgive. Maybe sometimes the wound is too deep and they need retaliation and revenge through the legal system. So the, the way the Quran is practical, not just ideal, ideal and practical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Isra, إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم. This Quran does indeed show the straightest way. So this Quran guides. But how can it guide? When you read it, understand it, feel it, reflect upon its meanings, and follow it, and apply it in your in your life. This is how it guides. Not when you read it without understanding. This is so important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Sad, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru ayati. A blessed book that I have descended on you so that they may reflect upon its meanings. The reason why Allah descended this book to us is to reflect upon its meanings, not to read it heedlessly. It is not a, a, a horseshoe that you, the people put on, the, on their doors to bring good luck. Unfortunately, some, many of us are dealing with the Quran like that, just reading it to bring good luck. No, that's not, that's not how we deal with the Quran. The Quran is a book to be read, understood, applied, felt, and reflected upon its meanings. The Quran should be reflected upon its meanings. When I say tadabbur, I mean that every single verse of the Quran is loaded with messages for your heart. Tadabbur is to decode the messages in the verses of the Quran and try to find what the verse is telling you. Some of us may say, but I'm not knowledgeable enough. I have to go to the tafsir. The tafsir is someone else's reflection. The Quran wants your reflection. The Quran was sent to people who were illiterate, to people who used to worship idols. They, were, they weren't really educated. And it helped them. No matter how your level of education, the Quran will help you. Just read it, understand it, reflect upon its meanings. Try to decode the messages in every verse of the Quran. As I said, tadabbur is a journey, 
The traveler in this journey is your mind. And the destination is the truth. So your mind tries to find the truth through the journey by walking through the Quran from one verse to the other. Today we are going to talk about Surah An-Nur. Surah. The word Surah is the feminine of Sur. And Sur means wall. And the wall is made of bricks. And the bricks strengthen each other. And they are like homogeneous. So the word Surah gives the impression that it, it has a theme. And it's made from verses that strengthen each other and are building on each other. So the whole meaning you get from the surah, when you read the whole surah, you understand what Allah wants you to, 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 to learn. Surah An-Nur has a main theme, and the main theme of Surah An-Nur is women. Modesty, women rights, etc. But mainly it's about women. That's why we need to learn this surah. Because when someone deprives women from their rights, usually it's men. Nur. Nur means light. The luminance which help to utilize vision. Without light, you don't see. Without light, you can't utilize your vision. And there are two types of light. Light in the hereafter and light in this dunya, in this life. The light of the hereafter is mentioned in the Quran. يَوْمَ تَرَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَسْعَى نُورُهُمْ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَبِأَيْمَانِهِمْ At the Day of Judgment, you will see the believers, men and women, with the light uh, in front of them and in their rights. So it's mentioned that there is light at the, in the hereafter. And there is light in this dunya too. And the light of this dunya is also of two types. The light of the mind, which can be sensed through wisdom. And the light of the sun or electricity or the reflection of the moon which can be sensed with your eyes. So they say light mahsus bi'ayn al-basar and light mahsus bi'ayn al-basira. Light that you can sense with your eyes and there is light which, which you can sense with wisdom. Ayn al-basira with your faculty of reason. And it is mentioned in Surah Al-Ma'idah, قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ نور. The verse says, Allah have sent you light. What light that Allah have sent to us? It's the Quran. And it's the Prophet ﷺ. This is the light of Allah, the guidance of Allah. So this is light that you cannot sense with your eyes, but you can sense with your wisdom. And, of course, we all know about the other sources of light, like the sun and the moon and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ الشَّمْسَ ضِيَاءً وَالْقَمَرَ نُورًا It is he who made the sun a shining radiance and the moon a light. Surah Al-Nur is Madaniya, is a Madinan surah. بالاتفاق. There's a consensus among all the scholars that it was sent in Medina. It was descended on the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And when I say in Medina, I mean, you need to understand that the Quran is either Meccan or Medinan. Every verse of the Quran is either a Meccan verse or a Medinan verse. What is a Meccan verse? And what's a Medinan verse? Here, there's a difference of opinions. A Meccan verse is not necessarily a verse that descended in Mecca but a verse that descended during the era of Mecca, which means before the immigration of the Prophet 
So even the verses that descended on the Prophet in a Ta'if, for example, are not called Ta'if verse. It's called Meccan verse because it descended before the immigration of the Prophet. And the verses of, of, of uh, the Medinan verses are every verse descended after the immigration, even if descended outside Medina. It's called Medinan verses. What's the difference between them? Are they all Quran? Yes, of course they are all Quran. But big difference between them. The theme is different. I can tell you something now that makes you know like that if the verse that you're reading is from Mecca or Medina. The Meccan verses deal with Aqidah. For 13 years, Allah did not send do's and don'ts. Aqidah deals with believing in Allah, believing in uh, the prophets, believing in the malaika, the angels, believing in the al-qada wa al-qadar, the divine destiny, and believing in the uh, hereafter. So it deals with that. So every time you hear a verse that talks about aqidah, it's definitely a Meccan verse. Blindly Meccan verse. Every time you hear or you read a verse that talks about the people who came before us, it's definitely a, a Meccan verse. All the verses that tell us the stories of the prophets, Meccan verses. But the verses that has do's and don'ts, legal system, halal and haram, Definitely Medinan verse. Ten years where the legal system was descending. It, uh, consists of, uh, it consists of 64 ayah, 64 verses. It descended uh, chronologically as number 100. So it is the number 100, the surah number 100 chronologically. But if you open the Mus'haf, if you open the Quran, you find that the surah number 24 so this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed it in the Quran. You know that at the last year of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he revised the Quran twice with Jibreel. Usually the Prophet used to revise it once every year in Ramadan, but that year he revised it twice in Ramadan and he, the, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered uh, Jibreel to to uh, put every surah in its place like that. So Surah Al-Nur chronologically was number 100. It descended on the Prophet ﷺ after Ida Ja'a Nasrullahi wal Fath and just before Surah Al-Hajj. But in the Mus'haf you will find it number 24. As I said, the main theme is about modesty and about women. The first verse of the surah says, أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سورة أنزلناها وفرضناها وأنزلنا فيها وأنزلنا فيها آيات بينات لعلكم تذكرون سورة أنزلناها This is a surah we have sent down وفرضناها and we made obligatory. وَأَنزَلْنَا فِيهَا And we have sent down in it clear revelations in it so that you may take heed. This is the only surah in the Quran that has an introduction above the surah. It starts with an intro speaking about the importance of the surah. There's no any other surah in the Quran so that's why it's unique. This is what makes it peculiar, is that this is the only surah that has an introduction about the importance of the surah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the subject pronoun we to emphasize. Allah says, this surah we have sent down and we have made obligatory and we have sent it down with clear revelations. Three times Allah is using the pronoun we, subject pronoun not object pronoun. 
Subject pronoun replaces the action doer. Object pronoun it replaces the action or the, the, uh, the object that received the action. So this is an important surah. And Allah emphasized on its importance like that in the first uh, verse. He said, we made obligatory. Which means that everything in it is not an object of choice. It's an obligation. It's not an advice. It's not a recommendation. It's an obligation. It's about instructions that has to be applied. And he said, we have sent down in it clear revelations, crystal clear instructions. No one can come and uh, say, any Allah talks about the, uh, uh, that fornication is not allowed. So, but we can replace this kind of uh, a punishment with any other punishment that suits people today. No. Allah says crystal clear. It's clear. Every single word, every single uh, uh, letter in it is clear. We don't need philosophy now. The verse ends with that I have sent this revelation. To, the verse says, this is a surah we have sent down and we have made it obligatory and we have sent down clear revelations in it so that so that you may take heed. It's, it's like to expose you for something which is so that possibly you may take heed. Therefore the goal of descending and obligating this surah is to wake us up. Wake up. Take heed. You can't read it like that without understanding. Reflecting upon this verse. That the Quran, not only the surah by the way. The Quran is a book to read, understand, reflect upon and apply. And whenever Allah orders something clearly in the Quran. Then it's not an option of choice. Whether we understand the wisdom behind the orders of Allah or we don't. Sometimes we understand the wisdom behind the order or we think that we understand the wisdom. Like for example, why don't we eat pork? You will find a lot of answers. It's disgusting. It's uh, uh, not unhealthy. It makes people ill. It has this. It has that. It doesn't digest. And we, okay. So we think that we understand the wisdom behind the order of Allah, which makes us uh, comfortable, and we apply it in our life, this action or this order, easily, because we think we understand the wisdom. But what if we don't understand the wisdom? Still we have to apply this instruction in our life. I believe, I believe, that the reason why we do not eat pork is that it is haram. That's it. When Allah forbade Adam and Eve from eating from the forbidden tree, it wasn't because it's poisonous. It wasn't because it is watered with garbage. It wasn't anything. It doesn't because it doesn't digest food. It wasn't anything like that. It was just a test, testing your iman. Eat from all the trees except this one. Allah said, eat all these, you know, meats except this one. That's it. Haram. Khalas. But you want to comfort yourself with these reasons? Do that. But anyway, all the obligations of Allah that Allah obligated on us, we should just follow whether we understand the wisdom or not. This means that we need to submit totally for the Quran. Submission. That's what Islam is all about. Submission to Allah. The second verse says, الزانيه والزاني فاجلدوا كل واحد منهما 100 جلده ولا تاخذكم بهما رافه في دين الله ان كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الاخر وليشهد عذابهما طائفه من المؤمنين. It means 
strike the adulteress and the adulterer 100 times do not let compassion from them keep you uh, compassion for them keep you from carrying out god's law if you believe in god and the last day and ensure that a group of believers witness the punishment in this ayah there is one piece of news and two commands one prohibition and one condition the piece of news here is the whole verse, giving us, telling us about the punishment of fornication. This is the news. The two commands I can see here is to flog the uh, fornicators and to make a group of the believers witness the punishment. The prohibition is from not carrying uh, uh, God's law because out of compassion to the uh, fornicators or the perpetrators. And the condition is if you believe in God, which means if you believe in God, apply the punishment of the fornicators. But this leads us to talk about Sharia. Ah. Because the word Sharia ah is a scary word. It scares people here in the West. And it actually, I'm sorry, it disgusts people in the West. I, I uh, uh, started to make some dawa on the train going from Manchester to Leeds. And the people talked about Sharia. Actually, I have a master's degree in Sharia. And as soon as they heard that, uh, they said, Sharia is disgusting. It disgusts people. Why disgusts people? Because they're ignorant. But we shouldn't just say because they are ignorant, we should also be self-critique. We should criticize ourselves. Number one, we scared people of Sharia. Number two, we do not understand what is Sharia ourselves. And that's why we scared people from it. You know when the, uh, when the Islamists reached office two years ago in, some, in Egypt, they said, okay, it's time to apply Sharia. Okay, give me the Sharia to apply it. Where's the Sharia? There's no book called Sharia to apply it. It's not like that. We need to understand, brothers and sisters, Sharia mainly is human rights given to people. And like a page at the end of the book is the punishment law or the punishments or the penal code or the crime a, a, a criminology or whatever. The problem is, as soon as we say Sharia, the first thing that comes to people's minds is cutting off hands. That's not true. Cut off hands of who? Of hungry people. So it's human rights. One of the rights is not to starve, not to live in the street. So it's human rights. People. Poor people have the right in the money of rich people, in the zakah. What's the percentage of zakah? 2.5%. No, 2.5% in our money, in the money of the rich people or people who have savings. But it's 5 to 10% of the agriculture. 10% if the country depends on rain. 5% if the country depends on irrigation system because there's some costs coming out uh, for the irrigation 20 percent called zakat riquez 20 percent of any extracted minerals like petroleum like gold like phosphate manganese all these things these treasures the poor have the right to 20 percent of it can you imagine 20% of the petroleum of Saudi Arabia, 20% of the petroleum of the Gulf. Do you know what does that mean? After giving people this money, they will not they won't there won't be anyone homeless. There won't be people who starve. There won't be people to to who are poor actually. What do you think will happen to the crime rate? Crime will not disappear but it will drop maybe to 5%. Who will still steal money? Those who take drugs or heroin. Understand me. 
But no one will steal to eat. No one will steal to, to buy medicine for his mom. No one will steal to pay tuition for his children. No one. Because this is covered. Then, when people still steal, you find the society asking that those people should be put in a grinder and be, and then we say, no, no, we don't grind. Sharia says only cutting off hands. The people say, no, it's not enough to cut off hands. Why? Because pe people are not stealing anymore, except if they're totally corrupt. But now when you say cut off uh, hands of uh, thieves, people say, what? What do you mean? It's barbaric, because actually it's, it's too many people who steal now. See, this is the issue. It, it, it's, it's, the Sharia is so wise, it's perfect. I was in uh, Oslo University a few years ago, and the, I was in a debate, and uh, the other man in the panel, he said, I don't respect your barbaric punishments. I said, and I don't respect your stupid punishments. He said, what? I said, what if someone breaks into a house, uh, p uh, beats up the, the owner of the house, um, breaks the safe box, and steals 25,000 euros? What happens to him? He said, he will spend like seven to 10 years in jail. I said, how much do you spend on him every year? He said, around 25,000 uh, euros. Said, what a genius. He steals 25,000, you spend on him 250,000? Whose money is this? Taxpayer's money? Who give you the right to do that? So the issue is, we can debate about that. He can attack the, the, the punishment of the Shia, I can attack it. But the issue is, no, there is much more about that. I said, I want to go with you to the nearest jail and make a survey. Let's ask all the people who were jailed for 10 years to choose between the two punishments. And I want to know who will choose to get a hand cut off and go back home at the day of the trial with his wife and with his children, to see them growing, to see them uh, 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 getting married, and to be with his wife, who became a widow while he is still alive, and his children who became orphans while he is still alive. And I want to know the percentage of people who will choose that. It will be a good percentage, actually. Are you more merciful to them than, uh, than themselves? This is the issue. No. The, so the issue is, when we talk about Sharia, we shouldn't scare people by speaking about punishments. Sharia is mainly human rights. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, if you want to watch a nice presentation, there is one on, the, on YouTube. If you type the words, Quran, the discovery of freedom. Quran, the discovery of freedom. It's a presentation that I gave in Brussels University three years ago. Comparing between the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights that were declared in the year 1948 by the United Nations, by the General Assembly of the United Nations, and between the Quran, but not as a book of God, as a, as a declaration of human rights that was declared 1400 years before it. And I put it both next to each other, and I proved to people that every single human right of the United Nations Declaration exists in the Quran. And then I show them human rights that are in the Quran, but until this day are not in the United Nations Declaration, until 2015. And I leave the audience with one question that I don't answer. Ask yourselves, why the old is more comprehensive than the new? Shouldn't be more comprehensive. It's old. And it's not 50 years older. It's 1,400 years older. Ask yourselves, why is it more comprehensive? Because it's divine. Because it's from Allah. And only the divine is perfect. So it's perfect. The human being is not perfect. So he cannot do anything perfect. He can do beautiful things like the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. It's beautiful, but it's not perfect because the human is not perfect. So when we talk about Sharia, we need to talk a lot about human rights. Plus, we need to understand something. Sharia is of two levels, personal level and societal and legal level. The personal level 
is obligatory on Muslim individuals. As a Muslim, I should apply it in my life. The halal and haram, the do's and don'ts. What to eat, what to drink, how to socialize, what's my, the, 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 my, how can I have relations with, my, with the people, with my family, and so on. This part is ob an obligation on individuals. But the other part is an obligation on the governor, on the ruling party. So when we are a minority in a non-Muslim country, don't think that you will see the Sharia governing here until we become a majority. But when we are a minority of 3% or 5% or 10%, we shouldn't stand on the corners of the streets and shout, we will raise the flag of the Sharia on Buckingham Palace. We're scaring people like that. We're disgusting people like that, actually. This is really crazy. How can you, how can people do that? So this is, this is something that we need to understand. When it comes to the penal code or the crime law or the governing laws, it is not an obligation on Muslim minorities because it is the responsibility of the ruler. That's it. We need to make sure that we make a good uh, life for our children that we have a good environment for them, that we don't put our schools at risk, our mosques at risk. When those guys who killed the, the, the cartoonists in, in France shouted, we took revenge for the prophet. No, excuse me, you put the schools of the prophet in France and in Europe in, at risk and in danger. You put the mosques of the Prophet at risk and in danger. You know that 90% of the mosques in France are not legal. They don't give them permits. They just leave them to pray like that. And they can shut down all of them now. Why? So this is something that we need to understand. When something in a Sharia, for example, when someone's uh, uh, verdict, when he commits a, a crime, and the verdict is that he is yuqtal. Yuqtal means to be killed. What does it mean? Like someone, for example, defaming the Prophet ﷺ. What does it mean, yuqtal? It means that when we take him to the court, the judge can go up to a execution sentence. But it doesn't mean that people can take guns and kill people in the streets. This is in itself a crime in Sharia, which is called uh, al-ifti'at, which means acting as a vigilante taking the, the responsibility of applying the law. or up, It's not your responsibility. It's not your responsibility. There is a very famous incident. Um, a famous companion of the Prophet called Salama ibn al-Akwa. He was a very strong companion. It, is, it says, they say that he, was, he can like chase a, an army alone by himself. So strong. In al-Hudaybiyah, he was resting, taking a nap or taking some rest under a tree. Four non-Muslims, four kuffar from the army of Quraysh came and rested under the same tree but from the other side. And they ha hung their, uh, their uh, weapons. So they were armless. And they started to call the Prophet Sallallahu bad names. They insulted the Prophet Sallallahu What did Salama do? He changed the tree. He went to rest under another tree. He could have killed them all, by the way. Or at least he could have beat them up and give them a good lesson. But he didn't. Why? Because the interest of the Muslim society is not in doing that. The Prophet wanted peace. The Prophet wanted a peace treaty with Quraysh. Who are you, Salama, to go and, and start a war? The interest of the Muslim society is not in starting a war like that. 23 years, not one companion of the Prophet went and uh, smashed one idol. Only when they took over Mecca and the Prophet became the ruler, he took the decision to destroy the idols. But 23 years, not one of them tried to destroy one idol. Why? Because Islam is a, a religion of law and order. Law and order not chaos. 
What happened is chaotic. And what's happening now is chaotic. When I see that, the first verse is an intro about the importance of the surah. And then the second verse goes directly to speak about zina, fornication, sex out of marriage. This denotes that that sin, the sin of fornication, is a grave sin. The surah directly starts by talking about fornication. It's a grave sin. And in this surah, there's a very interesting verse, uh, a very interesting, and this verse, verse number two, there's a very interesting part where it says, and make sure that a group of the believers attend the punishment, witness the punishment. Why is that? Hmm, who can tell me? Give me a reason. Hmm? To deter others who are thinking about fornicating, when they see the punishment in public, they are deterred. What else? This is the deterring, okay. Also, it's a part of the punishment, because it's a scandal. It's a part of the punishment to be publicly flogged. It's a part of the punishment. What else? A reminder for all, even those who are not thinking about fornication, but it reminds one, that this is something that Allah hates so much. But there's something very important. Huh? Recorded why? Okay, still, it, they will tell others, it will deter people. It's a way of public monitoring on the governor, on the ruler. Because if the ruler says, Okay, we apply the punishment on so and so. No, excuse me, who witnessed? Maybe because he's the son of a tycoon or a very rich man in society. So you just say that you flogged him, but he did. We have to monitor. Actually, in the United States, in execution sentences, it has to be attended, for example, in Missouri by 12 witnesses. Among them, there should be members of the family of the uh, murdered person and from the judiciary system and from the jury and the sheriff and some general public have to attend because it's public monitoring that the government is really applying the law. See, subhanAllah, 1400 years ago, this is there in the Quran. And the Prophet ﷺ actually also emphasized on this in a hadith where he says, O oh people, those who have gone before you were destroyed because if anyone of high rank committed theft amongst them, they spared him. And if anyone, uh, it, uh, if anyone of low rank committed theft, they inflicted the prescribed punishment upon him. So it means equality. All people in society are equal. Verse number three says, "Azaniya to azani, fajlidu kull wahid min huma mi'at jalda, wa la ta'khudkum bihima." This is the same verse. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here I want to talk in this verse also about another part, which is the condition, which says, "In kuntum tu'minuna billahi wal yawm al akhir," or you apply the punishments if you believe in Allah and the hereafter. So applying the prescribed punishments that Allah spoke about in the Quran is something the Prophet said, one prescribed punishment to be applied is better than 40 years of rain. Do you, can you, do you know what does it mean? 40 years of rain in Arabia at that time, in the desert? A lot of good. Actually, it's much better because it saves the society from corruption. And some people say, no, but still, you know, applying the Sharia is, of course, I'm speaking applying the Sharia in our personal level, individually, or in the Muslim countries. Some Muslims say, 
Oh, but actually, yeah, it's so hard, it's so difficult. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ Allah has imposed no difficulties on you in religion. But of course, in a non-Muslim country, a Muslim, as I said, has the duty to apply the personal part of the Sharia on himself, like the halal and haram and dealings with others and so on. So fornication is a very ugly sin, but still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. By, uh, by receiving the punishment of Allah, of the Sharia, one becomes purified. And even when people deal with them, we shouldn't. I want you to imagine that a young Muslim goes to, to an imam in a mosque and asks him to give him a fatwa to fornicate. Can you imagine this? Someone goes to the man and says, Imam, please tell me that it is halal to uh, uh, sleep with my neighbor. Do you know, what do you think will be the reaction of the imam? Huh? So angry of him. Maybe if this happens in Egypt, maybe he will like beat him up or, or with the shoes or something. But you know what? A young man went to the Prophet وسلم, and he asked him the same question. He asked him to do the same thing. He asked him to allow him to fornicate. He said, Oh Prophet of Allah, allow me to fornicate. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Do you accept it for your mother? He said, Oh no, Prophet of Allah. So the Prophet continued and said and asked him, Do you accept it for your daughter? He said, of course not, Prophet of Allah. He said, and people don't accept it for their daughters too. Do you accept it for your sister? He said, oh no, Prophet of Allah. He said, and people don't accept it for their sisters too. Do you accept it for your maternal aunt? He said, oh no, Prophet of Allah. He said, and people don't accept it for their maternal aunts too. Do you accept it for your paternal aunt? He said, oh no, Prophet of Allah. Of course, the Prophet was not using logic. He was using emotional influence. Had the Prophet been using logic, just logic, the first question could have been enough. Do you accept it for your mother? No, and people don't accept it for their mothers too. This is logic. But the Prophet continued because he's healing him spiritually. And then the Prophet ﷺ put his hand on his chest and he prayed for him. And the man said, I never felt to incline to sin after that moment. So even those who fall in sins, we need to be gentle and make dua for them and not to look at them as people who are worse than us. Because nobody knows how they will end and how we will end. Verse number three says, Al-Zani la al the, fornic the, uh, the adulterer is only fit to marry an adulteress or an idolatress. And the adulteress is only fit to marry an adulterer or an idolater. Such behavior is forbidden to believers. Which means the fornicator is only fit to marry a fornicator woman like him or someone who worships idols and a woman who who is an adulteress who fornicates is fit to marry some a fornicator like her or someone who is a polytheist and that is forbidden for the believers this verse descended on the prophet ﷺ for a reason there was a sahabi called marthad ibn abi marthad al ghanawi Marthad before Islam had a relationship with a prostitute in Mecca called Inaq. And one day he was in Mecca, so she told him, why don't you come and spend the night uh, in my uh, house? He said, I'm a Muslim now, I cannot do that. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ 
and he asked him if it's possible that he can marry her. He wanted to marry a prostitute. So the verse descended on the Prophet ﷺ, saying, fornicator marries a woman who fornicates. And the woman who, or, or a polytheist. And a woman who fornicates is only fit to marry a man who fornicates. The problem is, some people, when they, when they read the verse as it is like that, that a fornicator only marries, or a, an adulterer only marries an adulteress. I know someone uh, who, at the day uh, of his wedding, he beat up his wife. And they asked him why. He said, because she's an adulteress. How did you know this? He said, because I married her. What do you mean? He said, I committed adultery before. And the verse says, an adulterer only marries an adulteress or an idolatress. Since she, the marriage was consummated, I was waiting to see anything will just destroy this marriage. But since the marriage is consummated, therefore, she's an adulteress because Allah says, the adulterer marries an adulteress. Of course, this is a sick understanding of the verse. It means the adulterer cannot marry except an adulteress like him or an, but does it mean that since they got married then she's an adulteress? It means it's not fitting to marry except someone like him. And of course, this verse talks about boycotting people who spread lewdness, people who live a loose life. We cannot uh, socialize with them. For example, if one of us has a neighbor who is like a stripper who goes and, and, and dances in nightclubs and stuff like that, we don't socialize with them. They should be boycotted. Those people who spread lewdness should marry from each other. But we, we don't say, I'm going to marry her and inshallah, Allah will guide her. No, you cannot until Allah guides her. But you cannot. Okay? Uh, to reflect also, pairing fornication with polytheism. Because Allah says, a, uh, an adulterer cannot marry except an adulteress or a polytheist. Pairing this with polytheism denotes how grave the sin of adultery is. How grave the sin of fornication, actually. So it's like a fornicator is so close to be a polytheist. And actually, it is said that Al-Zina Barid Al-Kufr. I'm not sure if this is a hadith or not, but if not, then it's a, a saying of, of scholars. Al-Zina, adultery, is Barid Al-Kufr, which means, Barid means mail. You know, the, 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 uh, uh, to send something by mail. So it says like it leads to Kufr. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يزني الزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن. The fornicator does not fornicate while he is a believer. His iman is invalidated at that time. To take a lesson from this, don't take marriage lightly. Marriage is important. If you're young and you can afford to marry, don't postpone it. Just get married. Choose a good spouse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet said, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ When someone whose religion and character you are pleased with comes to you, then marry him. Get, marry people who are unmarried to each other. Make marriage, facilitate marriage. Those who have, I know that there are some people in our community who have matching system that match men to women and, and, and through them hundreds of people and hundreds of couples got married. This is something extremely uh, uh, beneficial for the society. Extremely important. You, you get rewarded for marrying people to each other. Don't take it lightly. And the Prophet, of course, also spoke about uh, uh, 
the woman who gets married. He said, a woman is married for four things. For her wealth, for her lineage, her family, for her beauty, or for her piety. Select the pious woman. May you be blessed. So he, is, he said, the four reasons why women get married are either they are wealthy, or they are beautiful, or from a high rank family, or because they, they are righteous. And then he says, take the righteous. This is the best one, the righteous one. If she's righteous and beautiful, okay. If she's righteous and rich, not bad. If she's righteous and so, not bad, but choose the righteous one. And there are types of zina, according to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Allah has decreed for the children of Adam a share in adultery. He will get it by all means. The adultery of eyes is looking. The adultery of tongue is speaking. The soul desires and has a passion and the private part confirms or falsifies it. So, there are things that gets you closer, close to adultery or to fornication by looking, by watching videos, by stuff like that. So you should stay away from this. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina." Don't come close to illegal sex. Coming close to it is by these things, by looking, by talking, by so on. So be careful. And the Prophet also mentioned that it is among the uh, signs of the hereafter. He said, it is from the signs of the last hour that knowledge would be taken away, ignorance would prevail upon the world, adultery would become common, and wine would be drunk. The number of men will fall short and the women would survive, and thus such a disparity would arise in the number of men and women that there would be one man to look after 50 women. Do you want to be among the muhajireen? The muhajireen who immigrated with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's called muhajireen. I don't say muhajirun, I say muhajireen. If you want to be a muhajir, the word hajara, in, in, in Arabic means to immigrate from or to depart from. The Prophet ﷺ said, المسلم من سلم المسلمون من لسانه ويده والمهاجر من هجر ما نهى الله عنه The Muslim is the one from whose tongue and hands the Muslim are safe. Muslims are safe. And a muhajir is the one who refrains from what Allah has forbidden. So if you refrain from what Allah has forbidden, you become a muhajir. You get rewarded as if you immigrated with the Prophet ﷺ. Just refrain from what Allah has forbidden. Next time, inshallah, we will start from verse number four, which talks about al-mula'ana. What if someone sees his own wife committing adultery? A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, if someone comes to you and says, I saw my wife with another man, you flog him. And if he stays silent and doesn't say, he can explode out of anger. And if he kills, you kill him. What can one do then? What if a man, what if a man, God forbid, goes home and finds this? Do you want him to go and bring four witnesses? So the Prophet made dua, Oh Allah, iftah. Oh Allah, send me an answer. And the answer came with verse number four. Like that, we finished today's session.